welcome everybody and uh, you'll hear a bit from me later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tessa. Yes, thank you. Um, now, I believe I just started recording the meeting. <laughs> um, <laughs> we shall see. Okay, um, so just a brief agenda overview. Um, we are going to talk about, um, you're gonna, you, we're gonna go over your transcript, which you received um, and which we're hoping you have a copy of in front of you, um, your, your child's transcript. Um, we're gonna review how to read a transcript, how to request one for a program. We're gonna talk about graduation requirements, including credits in particular um, subject areas, as well as um, um, testing as the regents exams and what's happening with those a little bit. We're gonna go over important parts of the HSAS uh, course catalog and academic policy guide, uh, study tips, extracurriculars, which is interesting, but you'll be surprised to learn that there, there are a lot of uh, interesting workarounds that um, students are using for extracurriculars. They're getting very creative. We're gonna talk a little bit about tips for learning at home. We're gonna talk about information on college entrance exams and um, a little bit about test optional trends in colleges uh, and some information on careers, including like some of the top careers that are um, looking very promising in the future. We like to always talk about the academic part of school. We like to always talk about college, looking towards college and always talk about careers. So without further ado, I'm gonna start uh, the beginning part. Um, first, I'm gonna stop my share, see who I can see here. And I am gonna try something I've never done, which is a quick poll. Add a question. Oh boy, now I can't see you guys. I hope this works out. Um, we see you. Oh, good. Okay. Well, you see me like typing. Okay. So the question is, uh, why am I suddenly forgetting? Um, uh, is for parents, is this your first child in high school? Question mark. Answer one. Yes. Answer two, whoops, no. Let's see if I can save this. And then I gotta figure out where the actual meeting went. Oh, there it is. Um, so, and I, this is not the best, uh, I wrote yes wrong. So I'm launching the poll and I want you to just give it a quick yes or no for the parents. We just wanna get a sense of where everybody is. Wow, this is so fast. So, so far we've got, ooh, the percentages keep changing. Um, in progress 20, ooh, I, I guess I only have a certain amount of, okay, I'm going to shut it off at one minute. We're at 30 seconds. I might actually be able to shut it off soon. It looks like 44 answered, 44 answered yes and 26 answered no. So that's 63%, this is their first child in high school, their first time they have a child in high school. And 37% uh, uh, said no. Okay, so that's good information. All right, um, I get to share results and I don't need to do that. Okay, that's too much for me. Okay, so this helps us because it gives us a sense of like all the things that we're talking about today and it kind of reinforces why it's important that we're doing this and we're talking about the academic policy for HSAS and also for the New York City Department of Education. So, and also how to read a transcript. Uh, so first, why are we here tonight though? Um, and I'm not gonna do another poll. <laughs> Uh, why are we here tonight and why is it at the midpoint of the year? These might be some questions that are um, in your head uh, or maybe not. Um, why are we here? We're here to provide an orientation to the school um, and to high school in general. And why do we wait until now? Um, we like to give students and families um, time to get settled, to get a kind of get in the flow of high school. Um, this year, the flow of high school is very different, but there's still a flow. Um, and 
also, we actually want to wait until you have some grades on a transcript, and that doesn't happen until after the end of January into February. Okay, so with that, we're going to talk about your transcript. If you do have your child's transcript in front of you, now would be a good time to kind of pull it out and take a look at it. Um, I am also going to share some things about how to read a transcript. Um, so first, some of you will notice that there were already eighth grade classes and potentially uh, regents exams that say waived after them on the transcript. Um, and many, uh, many times we get the question, why? Well, why is that? Um, this is because um, your child took a high school level course or courses at the middle school level in eighth grade, um, usually ending in a regents exam. Um, and so that remains on the transcript every year and follows them um, to college because the transcript is their legal document that, that shows their academic performance. Um, just a note that we do not have the ability to take off those eighth grade um, grades from the transcript. We can't remove them. Um, oh, I got it. Oh, thank you. Uh, and as far as how that might impact the cumulative GPA, um, just note that some colleges do recalculate the GPA. They all use kind of different formulas and some of them have a formula where they take off any eighth grade uh, grades on the transcript because they're not interested in eighth grade, they're interested in nine to 12. Um, it depends on the colleges. And when you get to that point, it's gonna be a really good question to ask, you know, for the schools that your child is applying to, uh, what is their policy and do they look at those grades, okay? So that's a little bit about the eighth grade grades. I am going to share my screen again. Let's go in there. That should be the right place. Okay, now, I hope that you all can see this. Um, if I could just get a few, I think there's a thumbs up thing um, or a smiley face, if you could just show me um, if you're able to see basically all right. Okay, all right. I see a few, okay. It may be a little bit minimized. Um, okay, good, good. All right, I'm gonna change my view. Okay, so this is a little bit about how to read the student transcript, okay? And this is, this is just like a general overview from the New York City Department of Education. I just want to note a few things that are important about it. Um, so first at the top here is all this, you know, student's name, address, you know, all the, you know, identifying information. Um, and then we go into number two, three, four, five, six. So you will see 2015 term two and then below it 2015 term one. Um, so what that means is 2015 term one is the first semester or the fall semester of 2015 and term two is the spring semester or second semester. So each time you have new grades added to a, a transcript, it, it comes up on the top of it. Um, and then eventually it goes down and fills the other side of the transcript. So then you will see, um, this is the um, identifying code for the school. This is the code for the class. This is their English nine class. This is actual mark and numeric equivalent. The actual mark is the grade that they earned in the class. Um, at High School of American Studies, we have uh, grades on a 100 point scale. Some schools have A, B, C, D, F, et cetera. And so you might see like a B plus there and then a numeric equivalent. For us, you'll always see that this number and this number are the same. Here is the credit attempted and the credits earned, okay? So at the bottom, you'll see that this student um, attempted, it says actual credits. That's um, the amount that they tried to get and four points, so they got five, they tried for 5.75 and they got 4.75 because they didn't pass a class. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means later. I'm just gonna jump down to the bottom, number nine, 
exam summary. So the exam summary, I'm gonna like see if I can maximize this a little bit. This is the Regents exams um, and they'll be listed what term they were of what year and what the score was. And finally, term average. Actually, there is something where I can draw on this, but yeah, I'm not gonna do that right now. I'm, I'm tempted, but I'm, I'm not gonna get sidetracked. Okay, so the term average is the um, GPA that the student earned for a term. And then the cumulative average is however many terms added up divided by that number of terms. So that's your GPA, okay? So that is a brief overview of how to read the student transcript. Um, I think what I will do is I'll take a minute. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can um, put them in the chat. Let's see. Ooh, we have chat questions. Um, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. All right. People were writing yes or no to the. Okay. All right. If you have any questions about the transcript, uh, you can put them in the chat. Otherwise, we'll. Ooh, there's one O in there. How do I get down there? Okay. Ah, how does that relate to a 4.0 scale? So, um, oh, and there's another one. How exactly do we find the transcript? <laughs> so um, we emailed the transcript to each and every student um, within the last couple weeks. And we CC'd the parent as well, at least one parent, whoever was on it. We have something called Naviance where we send emails um, through. And so your child will have their transcript. They will have it in their HSAS DOE um, email. Also, you can go to the New York City Schools account, as uh, Ms. Fiore was talking about at the beginning, and you can find the transcript there. So that's where it's highly, highly important that if you haven't already, you go into this New York City Schools account and follow these instructions. It's about seven pages of instructions, but it's step-by-step, step. it's super easy. I've done it for my son and you sign up and you can get the information there as well. Now, um, as far as translating it to a 4.0 scale, we will get to that. We will share that with you um, a little bit later on, but we do have a, trans, a, a way that it's translated to a 4.0 scale. And also when you get to the point Colleges tend to switch things over to a 4.0 scale, but they do it with their own system and it's kind of independent for each school. There's a general um, sort of guideline for what it looks like on 4.0 scale. And you can even just Google um, 100 point to 4.0 scale and you'll find something from the college board, okay? Okay, Ms. Harris, yes. Yes, and we hand those out regularly and I could um, email that one out to everybody. Let me just... Put it, I couldn't fit it into all the handouts last night, but we can get that out to you. But it's very accessible. We work with that with the students a lot. Let me just, um, okay. okay, that's it for me. Okay, great, great. Okay, so I am going to, wait, did I mute myself? I did not, ah, uh, good. Okay, I'm gonna move on to directions for requesting a high school transcript. Okay, so we did just send out copies to all of your kids. They should save that copy um, somewhere on a desktop or laptop somewhere that they can. Um, because a lot of times, uh, especially as we head towards the spring, there are internships, there are summer programs, there are still things happening. Uh, even though things are kind of closed down, there are still a lot of things that are happening virtually and some things that are not happening virtually more in the summer. And so um, there is a process for requesting a transcript from a counselor. So sometimes students will say, well, I lost my transcript, I can't find it. Um, you know, and they'll come by, you know, in, in the old days, they would come by our office and ask us how, you know, how they can get it. This is the process, okay? First of all, you must allow 10 school days. Um, and actually, I'm going to jump back a little bit and I'm going to say that we want your child and not the parent to make this request. You make the request to me if you are a student with the last name Klingen Smith to you, and you make the request to Ms. Harris if your last name is um, Abel Tuli, Abel Tuli, okay? 
So the student would do it and not the parent. Um, the reason why is we're really trying to um, teach kids more about independence and taking responsibility and getting them on the way to, you know, adulthood and these things that they're going to have to handle when they do the college application process and uh, when they move off and, and go to school or, um, you know, go into their post-secondary lives. So 10 business days or 10 school days is very important. They need to email Ms. Harris at M. Harris for schools, or this is my um, New York City Schools account, okay? You need to know what your transcript is needed for and provide the full name and website of the organization or whatever it is. Um, I'm gonna minimize this a little bit so I can see a little better, move it over. Um, please provide any specific instructions for how you need the transcript delivered. We are not snail mailing right now. We really, you know, I'm basically working from home. So is Ms. Harris. Um, so it usually is sent to someone, an email address, um, uploaded to a particular um, website, or there's a link. Um, but please tell us those exact instructions and note whether it needs to be official, okay? An official transcript is stamped and, and sealed and everything. Well, if it's you know put in an envelope and handed to you, it would be sealed, but it's stamped, it's signed by us. Um, and you must, I put this in green, do not forget to provide a due date, okay? Um, finally, note whether a written counselor or teacher recommendation is required. Please note that we do not handle uh, any teacher recommendations. You do that directly with your teacher. Um, and also there is a separate counselor recommendation letter request um, that is required. And this form plus that counselor recommendation request form were sent on January 11th. They were sent to all students across all grades um, and all parents um, in our system, okay? So your child should have that and, um, and keep those, you know, how to request a transcript, this form, how to request a transcript and the other form that um, is what is needed for a recommendation letter and um, know where they are, okay? Because they're gonna need to use them. Um, and I believe that's it for how to request a transcript. Um, I think what I'll do is go on to the next thing let me just find where I am. I took some nice notes. Um, this is the High School of American Studies graduation requirements grid, right? Um, so for people who are, who learn better by looking at something more like this, as opposed to what I'm about to go into, <laughs> I got to go to the top of it, but there's a lot more words and things um, and it, it might kind of like make your eyes gloss over. So if you want to have, if you did make a copy, if you were able to make a copy um, and you want to have this in front of you, this is like a nice kind of one pager that gives you what um, the credits are that are required um, to graduate with the High School of American Studies endorsed diploma. And it talks and it breaks it down by um, the different subjects and also talks about the regents exam. So it's all on one page, but I'm gonna go into it a little bit, in, uh, a bit more in detail as I go through this, which is, let me get to the top, the course catalog and academic policy guide. Before I get into this, I just want to give you guys some terminology that can be confusing. Um, we're talking about three different diploma types. There is the High School of American Studies Specialized High School Endorsed Diploma. So it's a, it's a di diploma specific to HSAS. Um, and we're going to talk about that. Um, so the requirements are a little bit more. Uh, then there is the advanced regents diploma. So there are two types of state diplomas through New York State, the advanced regents diploma and the regents diploma. Um, so the advanced regents diploma, as the name suggests, is kind of a higher level diploma because it, it has more requirements, including um, four more regents exams. 
Um, the Regents Diploma is a more basic diploma with less requirements. It's kind of a last option for High School of American Studies students. Um, the majority, the, almost 100% of um, HSAS students receive the HSAS endorsed diploma, which also meets the uh, Advanced Regents Diploma requirements. So getting into the course catalog, um, and then I don't know if um, Ms. Harris, if you could, if you see any, if you can monitor the chat and you want to stop me at any time um, and, you know, I can try to answer some questions, um, maybe I could. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Is the information also available? Um, the transcript request forms are probably need updating many things on the website probably uh, need updating. Can you make the transcript request link available in this meet? Uh, that I'm not sure. And uh, grade changing, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. That's going to come up in the meeting. I somebody asked about the grade MT. I think that was a middle school grade. I really don't know what that means. I've seen that on a couple of transcripts. I don't know if it meant, meant standards. I, I, I have no clue. Uh, so that's what we have in the chat so far. Yeah, and as far as this, um, just, just know that all of these forms that we are going through with you, Ms. Harris sent this morning to all of the families and students. So you guys should have it in, in numbered order in, in your inbox or your child's inbox, okay? Um, and I, I, I mean, I'm not sure if I, yeah, uh, making it available in the chat is kind of like, you're, you're taking my uh, late forties brain and it just went, um, but um, <laughs> I'll see about it maybe when Ms. Harris is doing um, her part of the course catalog and academic policy guide. I just um, see, wait, I do, some of the things, some of the questions that are coming up, we're going to be definitely covering. So yeah. let's, I think, maybe get through it a little bit more because they're, they're, um, they're definitely going to be covered. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Um, we're going through a lot of the nuts and bolts of the requirements um, by going through this course catalog. Um, so maybe try to hold on to those a little bit, see if they're answered. And then if they're still not answered, you know, um, ask us at the end. Okay. Um, all right. So the course catalog, High School of American Studies, course catalog and academic policy guide, you will note that this is 2019-2020. Um, due to the pandemic, you know, we shifted priorities to much more pressing matters. And so this is what we have, but it's basically up to date and any changes um, I noted, I went through and I highlighted some important things and any changes or things that really need to be noted from this year, from last year to this year, I highlighted in green and we'll go over. So this is just a school description. I think you all know that we are HSAS. So we're focused on American history. Um, also, you know, we offer all honors level courses. We offer seven AP courses, um, courses, uh, a course at Lehman College. Um, and so you can read through that if you'd like to look at more in depth at the description of the school. Um, our academic policies. So uh, let's see. This is where we get into some important information. So graduation diploma and examination requirements. First of all, we're gonna talk about credit requirements and you can see here that we're gonna go through them one like subject area by subject area. So this uh, yellow highlighted stuff is really important. At the end of each semester, uh, credit is earned for each class that a student passes. A passing grade is a 65 or higher. Anything below that is not a passing grade. So whatever credit was assigned to that course will show up as zero, okay? Um, the amount of credit depends on how often the course meets. 
in um, regular days when we were in person, English class is a one credit per semester course, which would meet four times a week. Now that we are in virtual learning, it has been adapted. And so English meets uh, two times a week in uh, virtually and then asynchronous another two times a week. So things have been adapted for this year. As you know, we've been doing nothing but adapting. Um, so point in that is just understanding that if a credit, if a student does not pass a course, the credit must be made up, okay, in order to meet the graduation requirements. Um, okay, AP courses. Um, I, I bolded this, highlighted this, everything here. When your child starts taking AP courses in 10th grade, they'll be taking AP World History. That's their first one. Um, they are weighted by a factor of 1.1 in the computation of grade point averages. So when you look at the transcript, um, what you will see is maybe your child got a 98 and then it doesn't look like, like there was, you know, a 98, well, that should move up or, or 100 should actually show up as 101 in their actual grade. It won't show up there. It will show up in the cumulative average, right? So when we were talking about right here, it'll show up here. It will not show up here in the actual grade. So let me get back to where I was. Okay, we're going to go through some, so, and some other very important information. Um, okay, this is what's required to graduate with the specialized high school endorsed HSAS endorsed diploma. Okay, social studies 12 credits. The typical high school requires only eight credits, um, and two of those would be in US history. Since we are a US history focused school, we require six credits. So that's where that additional four goes in. So these are the courses and they go through um, the first three years of your child's um, uh, high school experience. Uh, they take four credits of global history, global one and two and AP world history one and two. In senior year, they take one semester of government, one semester of economics. Um, English is um, eight credits. And I want you to think about this with, with kind of the core courses, English, uh, math, science, social studies. Those are all courses where there's one credit per semester. So when you see eight credits, that's eight semesters. And that means that your child must take and pass English every semester of every year of high school to keep up to speed, to not start to fall behind and need to make up credits. So, and the same with social studies, okay? Um, so the, you see the course sequence, English one, two, three, four, and then in um, junior year, there is English five or six or AP English language one and two, and then there's also an AP English literature that's offered in senior year. So there are some choices there. Um, there's also, um, I, I believe Ms. Harris is going to get more into the requirements for the AP um, courses, but basically, um, you know, you have to have a certain grade point average. And I believe for the English classes to get into the AP English classes, you may also have to, your child may also have to write an essay. Um, okay, so for mathematics, there are eight credits that are required. Um, this is what they look like. I wrote in here, we now have a green part, course name and sequencing change. Okay, so there was a little bit of a change this year. Um, let me just get, I'm in page five, page five highlights. So the class of 2024 math changes are that all students are taking algebra advanced topics this year. They will then have an opportunity to go one of two courses. Um, to take an accelerated geometry class that is capped off at the end at the end of that year next year with um, algebra two algebra two so accelerated algebra two which is um, usually like if you're just going at a kind of regular pace 
what you would do is algebra first year, geometry second year, algebra two and trig um, the third year. And then if you wanted to take AP calculus, um, you might have to take pre-calculus in addition to algebra two and trig um, in your spring semester of junior year. Um, so this is kind of accelerating things so that students can then be ready to take pre-calculus um, in that second semester of junior year. So there's going to be two kind of ways, avenues that students can go, and there will be more information to come from the math department as we get closer to the end of the year. I need a drink. Hold on. Delicious water. Okay. Okay. For... HSAS, we require six credits of science, though students can take more. Um, there's biology this year, chemistry next year, physics in 11th grade. And in 12th grade, there is an AP science offering. Right now, that's um, AP biology. The other requirements are six credits of foreign language, and that is Spanish. Um, so all students must take six credits of the same language um, in order to meet that requirement. And at HSAS, it is only Spanish. Then there are two credits of the arts. Um, these are typically um, 0.5 credits per semester, adding up to like um, four different semesters. So over two years of taking arts courses, visual arts, music, um, and there's a photography course as well. Uh, health is one credit that's spread out um, over two semesters, and PE is seven semesters, adding up to a total of four credits. So please do take PE seriously. Um, it's important. It's really important right now that we all like try to get moving, even if it's like in our little spaces doing some stretches and yoga, but um, PE is an important part of the um, requirement for graduation as well. And then you will note this, courses at Lehman College. Here it says two credits, two courses, and that is crossed out. That's, that's a strike through. Um, now, as of now, the requirement is going to be one credit for Lehman College. Um, so Lehman College, the reason why this happened is really due to the pandemic and shifting priorities and concerns. Um, we're still kind of, you know, because many things are uncertain, we're still kind of waiting um, and we will see if this will change. But as of now, there is a one credit requirement and that's a college course taken at Lehman College. Any new information that we get um, will be given to you as well. Okay, so just note also that um, all students are programmed so that they can fulfill all of these credit requirements. They are not allowed to be exempted from taking these course requirements. So a student can't say like, oh, I don't wanna do all of these. I just wanna do the course requirements that are the minimum for the Regents, um, for, for the Regents Diploma. Um, Part of joining High School of American Studies is agreeing to attempt, make every attempt to get our diploma. And so you will be um, scheduled and programmed that way. Okay, um, there's a note here about entering ninth grade students taking a placement exam in math and foreign language. That obviously didn't happen this year because of the pandemic we needed to socially distance and so sitting in the same room taking a placement exam was not an option. Um, the other thing that's very important to know is that students can't use credits that they get at Lehman College to fulfill these graduation requirements, aside from the, the HSAS endorsed diploma one credit from Lehman, right? So I'll give an example. Um, let's say you need an extra Spanish credit to fulfill your six credits. And so you um, decide to take a Spanish elective at Lehman College um, for your college course. You can't use that for both. Um, so the Spanish um, requirements need to come from High School of American Studies. Okay, so let's move on a little bit. So, oh, sorry. This is um, 
So students who fail to fulfill the minimum, the above distribution requirements for their credits can still graduate from high school. Um, they would need to earn the total of 44 credits. And this is the credit distribution. This is for what I was um, talking about is the, um, the uh, why am I completely blanking? <laughs> the Regents Diploma. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a long day. And this is what the breakdown looks like. Um, so you'll notice there are eight credits in social studies. Um, just know that there really the, the main differences are eight credits in social studies, um, six credits in math, and only two credits in foreign language. And that this is really an 11th hour kind of thing. Um, students are programmed to get the HSAS diploma and we, are, we don't really turn to this until the 11th hour. And we don't have, we, we have very few students who don't actually get that diploma, our diploma. Okay. All right, moving on, promotional requirements. Every year, students need to have meet certain benchmarks in order to promote, to move up to the next grade. Moving up from ninth to 10th grade, um, the student, each student needs to earn a minimum of eight credits, okay? When you get to promoting from 10th to 11th grade, it's 20 credits, including four credits in history and four credits in English, okay? And from 11th grade to 12th grade, it goes up to 30 credits. And again, four credits in history and four credits in English, you know, but that would mean if somebody was in that particular situation, they would need to double up on both English and history, which would be, you know, kind of a challenging um, 12th grade experience. So um, I'm also just going to go into Regents exams. Um, I wrote some stuff on here. Um, I found a way to take notes. I was doing all kinds of fun stuff here. So and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> the Regents exam. Actually, you know what? I do want to jump back. OK. Let's see. This is page six, right? Yes. OK, so this is a good time for me to just stop for a second. I wanted to um, give you a couple uh, bits of information about things that have changed with the transcript and grades due to the pandemic. And this is very important information. So the, in, in April, the New York City Department of Education created a new COVID-19 grading policy. What that said is that um, what's pertinent for high school students is that any student who fails a course during this pandemic and virtual learning um, does not receive a failing grade. <clears throat> you have a drink of water. What they receive instead is called an NX. The NX stands for incomplete. Typically, this was only given to students when maybe they were out for, you know, a medical emergency that, you know, they had to be out for a while or something happened and they were out of school for a while, they got behind and they needed to be given an incomplete so they had some time to make it up. And then they would only be given into the first term of the next semester to make up the, the work that they needed to make up to earn a grade. Because of COVID-19, that has been extended. So Instead of receiving an F, which is equal to zero credits, a student gets an NX and they have until the end of the following semester. So if you get an NX, if any student got an NX or an incomplete in the fall semester, they would have until the end of June to get um, any work made up. It's also the student's responsibility um, to reach their teacher about what they need to do. Some teachers create new assignments um, that, you know, kind of reflect the, the learning goals that they need to meet. Some of them give them makeup work. Every, every teacher is going to be different, but it's very important if your child has an NX or NXs that they reach out to their teacher um, and start that process now. Uh, the other thing that has changed 
<clears throat> is something called um, CR or credit received. So when you get your child's transcript, you can request the family. This is where the family needs to email actually Mr. Weiss and request that a, not a letter grade, a number grade be um, changed to CR for credit received. Um, when a, a number grade is changed to CR for credit received, um, it does not factor into the student's grade point average. So if you feel that there is um, a particular class that your child was really struggling with and that their, um, their grade really doesn't reflect um, doesn't reflect their ability because of their struggles, because of the pandemic and you know, trying to interact with a screen and everything like that, then you can ask, you can write an email to Mr. Weiss and request that list the course and ask that it be changed from a number to a credit received grade. For this past semester, the due date to do that is this coming Monday, so Monday, March 1st. Um, and Ms. Harris, I don't know if you want to add anything. I might just like pull up the chat um, and see if there are any questions about that. I mean, that's kind of in discussion with seniors and, you know, worrying about college and appearance, um, I wouldn't jump in. Mr. Weiss and I, we had a talk and like maybe something below an 85, you might want to contemplate. We've had a lot of kids want to change gym grades to CR. A, a transcript is more about a story. As I said to the kids, it's the numbers, the num it's not the numbers, it's the story that the numbers tell. So with those CRs, just, you know, seek out a little advice from one of us and make sure, um, or Mr. Weiss, because it does, it is concealing something and it's pretty evidently concealing something. So I think if it's below an 85, it's, it's something to contemplate. Um, anything above an 85 or above, this is a difficult time. Everybody's going through this nationally, internationally at the same time. And there's been quite a bit of leniency. And I've, uh, of course, I'll be touching on some of those topics, uh, the changes that we've seen with the college uh, piece and transcripts and such. So that's, that's my little bit of advice. So we had another question and um, <clears throat> I cannot for the life of me remember the answer to this. Um, it's, can an NX then become a CR? Uh, well, an NX means it's incomplete. So but once they complete the work. Yes, yes, that I have seen happen. They so it can become CR work. as opposed to the, the, the number grade. They get to the 65 and then the 65 could be made a request to become a CR, but okay. they must complete the work first. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now it's coming back to me. I think that we had a little bit of that. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to close the chat and I'm going to move on a little bit. Okay, so we explained that. We talked about NXCR. Um, the deadline again for that CR um, change is uh, Monday. So you would need to email Mr. Weiss, okay? Um, it's not something that comes to myself or Ms. Harris. It goes to Mr. Weiss. Okay. Um, Regents examinations. We're going to talk about these a little bit. Before we start with anything, it's not really in here anywhere, um, but you will note that um, for, for any students who took uh, Regents level courses in eighth grade, um, that probably what you see in the transcript next to the Regents exam is WA for waived. So what's happening right now is obviously students cannot congregate and um, you know come together and uh, take the regents exams and so they are being waived and so we're taking that to mean waived means waived right so um, that does not mean you have to go back and take that exam three years later when you've forgotten you know a good portion of the course so. 
you can let that go for now. And then when things get back to more of a normal state and we can have students testing, then the regions will be back. Okay, given that, this is the order of regions exams that are, um, this is, this is um, the number of regions exams that are required to receive the advanced regions diploma. Um, and there, that's also to receive the High School of American Studies endorsed diploma. So for each of them, you have to earn a mark of 65 or higher. They are English and I wrote next year in not very good writing. That happens in 11th grade in the middle of the year actually. Algebra, that's at the end of ninth grade. So chances are this year at the end of ninth grade, you will have algebra regions on your child's transcript with WA for waived after it. Um, then geometry, 10th grade, algebra two, 11th grade, global history, 10th grade, US history, 11th grade, uh, foreign language, Lote um, happens in year three of the class when they take it. So um, just note that. And then the two science exams are chemistry and physics. All right, I just noticed the time. I am really sorry, Ms. Harris. Um, no okay, the Regents Diploma, what you really need to note is just that these are the Regents exams you need to take. Um, I'm going to move along for the sake of time. AP exams. Um, there are two AP exams that are required at HSAS. They are world history and US history. And just note, there are other advanced placement courses um, available. Students who enroll in an AP course are supposed to sit and take the AP exam. Um, and if they do not, then they will not receive an AP designation for the course on their transcript. Um, this gives you an outline of when they happen, but I'm gonna kind of push through it because um, we need to move on um, to Ms. Harris because uh, we're running a bit late. Okay, so I will now share my screen. You will unshare your screen. Uh, let me share my screen. And again, um, hold on a second. Okay, share, share. And I am going to get to number six okay course catalog part two so again i i just let me get this pulled up give me a moment and there it goes okay can everybody can you see it okay so again i'm going to just kind of pick up where miss um miss Teslik le left off and I just wanna say this pandemic has been really, really difficult. Uh, this has been a really hard way to start high school. We hope, I hope I never see another mask again, unless maybe a doctor is giving birth to a child, then I would accept it. But uh, we're gonna, we're gonna leave, leave every of this behind. We're gonna take what we need and leave what we don't as the yoga world says. Okay, so these are our AP exams offered at the High School of America. I can't see anybody. Well, I can see, oh, okay, I put on some faces now. I have to see faces when I'm doing this. Otherwise, these are our, our seven AP classes. Basically, when the grades, you all have this in your handouts. I'll go into some more detail. Um, again, mandatorily, everybody takes US and world. Um, it's come to the point where most students take the Englishes, and when it comes to the calculus and the, um, and the biology and the Spanish, that's a little bit of a different story. So Mr. Weiss here has kind of laid out a bit of a testing schedule. Now, as you know, we have different levels of math. Some kids start out a little bit more advanced and other kids don't. Same with Spanish. So we're small enough, what you have to keep in mind, this is not a large high school. So these uh, kids don't slip through the cracks when it comes to this type of placement and programming. If someone is misplaced, often it's very common in all the years at HSAS, a lot of eight, uh, ninth graders will say, oh, I took this algebra, you know, it feels like a repeat for me. It does elevate as the years go on, the, the math, department and the Spanish department take a lot of pride in its placement 
policies. So you'll see that when it says algebra regions, some students, uh, June algebra regions, so that, that more advanced group takes it in the, um, and it's not like tracking or anything like that because the good news is in 11th grade, um, back going up here, the highest level math that we offer is calculus AB in 12th grade. So this is a little confusing. What happens in, in the spring of 11th grade is students who have in ninth and 10th and the first half of 11th grade demonstrated a real ability, have grown in math, really wanna take that higher level math course. They are given an opportunity to double up, take two math courses simultaneously in the spring of 11th grade. Um, again, I'm assuming these are policies that are going to stay and that when this nightmare ends, we're going to go back to all of these great things and we're doing that now. Um, so as far as the, the AP and somebody put this in the chat, you, you actually don't see the weighting on the grade, the ninth grade, you're taking the world history, but it's not until May of uh, the, when they take the AP uh, in 10th grade where the courses are actually weighted and you get some weighting on your transcripts. Um, let's see. Now we're gonna talk a little bit later about testing, but in October, we were giving the PSAT um, just for pure practice. In 10th grade, it's practice and practice only. Unfortunately, the DOE, even though we haven't set up any testing this year, announced for this year, not next year, but for this year, they will not fund, due to funding cuts, the 10th grade to take that free practice test. I have been in the DOE since 21 years and I've seen these models change. That's why um, of when they give it, who they give it to, what they pay for, what they won't, so we have to keep track of this stuff. Um, October, we, we don't, the DOE, again, based on the last few years of the model, that's when the students can take the PSAT to qualify for the National Merit Scholarship Competition. And we, the DOE does not fund that. It's like a $15 test. We set up the whole thing. If the kids apply, uh, qualify for a fee waiver, they are waived from that fee and it's, it runs pretty smoothly in the, in the regular pre-pandemic world. Um, so this is basically just a schedule of when uh, students take tests. And again, March or April, the last few years, the DOE has, has shifted from giving the PSAT for free to the 11th grade. That's why we now have to have it pay to giving the SAT to the 11th grade in March or April based on the spring break. Um, all students will take the AP World History in, in uh, May of 10th grade and the AP US History in May of 11th grade. And then dependent upon, you know, which of these courses and a very few, but some do, most take up to, I would say anywhere from four to a few end up managing somehow pro programmatically squeezing in all seven AP classes. I don't know how they do it on every level, but they do. Um, October, uh, sometimes seniors. And again, the whole, when you listen to this meeting and anything that we talk about um, testing, it's all up in the air right now. That has been the big part of the college process that's really been changed, altered, amended, dropped, whatever adjective you want to use, it is really a different landscape. And that's a really uh, tough challenge working with kids who take a test to get into school. So again, the PSAT, as Mr. Weiss said, in past years, they have provided the exam free to all. They already announced this year, no more funding for this year. That could all change next year. Um, let's see that you do get one thing I can say about the college board and it's gotten a lot of negativity, positivity, and I have it in my notes some year. They do give a lot of free resources. And when the kids do take the PSAT, we're very careful to uh, go over the scores or help them get their scores. And there's so much analytical material that comes with that. So 
basically the SAT college board is the umbrella for the SAT, the APs. They have recently dropped the writing component. They have dropped the um, SAT subject tests. The SAT really does me measure critical thinking um, and of course, mathematics. Um, the writing, as I said, was removed recently. So all juniors at HSAS, I believe that will continue. Would you take the SAT? And I'll tell you a little bit about what happened later on and how it shook out during the pandemic. Um, a lot of students, this whole testing component is again, I would say the biggest challenge I have faced as a guidance counselor. The kids came to high school taking a test and it's very, very hard to shake that mentality of how important and the role they place on that SAT. Um, students, uh, when they take the SAT outside of the school, they register themselves, they pay themselves. If they qualify for a fee waiver, the guidance counselor issues a code and it's just like inputting a credit card. You put in that code and they get it for free. The ACT, um, I'm not sure they have not made any announcements that they were gonna drop the writing. They were instilling some new things that they had to drop because of the pandemic. I would say at HSAS we're somewhere like 65, 35, 70, 30, 70 taking the SAT, 30. It's, it's varied. In the beginning, hardly anyone took the ACT, but now starting with 10th grade, we really, in 10th grade is the time, in the latter part of 10th grade is the time to really start. Nobody can tell uh, a test taker what test is better for that test taker other than the test taker themselves. So we start to introduce materials, have them look at both, and they make that decision where of the belief to pick one and stay with one. The DOE has its contract with the college board. Um, okay, moving along. So SAT, okay, so HSAS is not a designated testing site. For example, Bronx Science is larger schools. We do not register, we do not host the uh, tests there. The only tests we host there are the, the, um, the one that the DOE funds. And of course, all AP scores under normal times take place in school. So college board testing accommodations. If you have a child who has had an IEP or a 504, it is not rolled over to the college board or the ACT. Each organization has its own process for applying for accommodations. The good news about the college board, um, it's a little more streamlined and diff different. We have Mrs. Ramo, our part-time counselor, working on that. But once you get a college board testing accommodation, again, which covers the um, SAT and the AP, no, so, no more subject tests, those are dropped. It, that accommodation holds for the remainder of high school. So if you know you've always had that um, accommodation and you need that extra time, or there's a medical accommodation, you need to eat or drink while taking a test breaks. That is something you can start applying for early. Uh, they do, they do, we don't review any of the documents. They're all sent off to the college board. They review all of those documents. There are one or two accommodations that bring the test into the school, meaning we have to give it at the school and then we have to secure, and again, this is under no social distancing, regular, uh, regular uh, circumstances, then we have to get a proctor, a room and a place to give the test. Now with the writing, typing and keyboarding was one, but now with the essay dropped, probably most accommodations can be, um, can be accommodated at a test center. So, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into testing a little bit uh, later on. So transcripts and grades. When we met with your students, um, when we, students who are there, we gave them a very nice consolidated handout about the academic year, how it's two semesters. We just finished the first semester. 
students apply to college with six semesters, the seventh semester called the mid-year grades. Um, over the years, we have a good 70% of our class applying to college through some type of early action or early decision program. So that means they, can, they apply with six semesters. Um, students are graded on a hundred point scale um, and the minimum and the passing mark is 65. This here is the old NX. As Ms. Tesla uh, stated, there is a medical when students have a certain issue, they get an NX and then an arrangement is made for them, you know, and of course that has to be documented. So the DOE has taken and adopted that term to meet to mean something else and utilize it a little differently in the time of this pandemic. Uh, let me see. So that's the old NX policy. Okay. So again, as noted earlier, um, the AP marks are weighted the way we explain it to the students and Ms. Teslick explained it perfectly, but the simple way is that if a kid does tests, projects, quizzes, and they earn a 92, they get a 92, the weighting shows up in the average. It's not like they got an 89 that's then bumped up to whatever. Um, so uh, let's see. Let me see where we are. Students, okay. So when it comes to college time, um, Ms. Teslick went over how to, how to, over the years, most of these programs allow students to upload the PDF or if they really want it official, we can, we can email it from our addresses. For the college process, we have a whole organized system of procedures that we review very intensely and very carefully and we drip, dribble it out over the years. Um, but again, as I said, a lot of programs now are allowing students to scan and upload their own transcripts um, more so than in the past. Um, once the kids start taking Lehman courses, that um, the Lehman transcript is really only ever needed when you're really trying to acquire college credit once you've been accepted into a college You've accepted them, they've accepted you. Okay, we do not rank at High School of American Studies. Uh, we don't want to encourage any kind of competition. There is an unofficial rank list, of course. What we do report to colleges is the cumulative class average. Uh, we put that on our school profile, which is not on the website. We will give the class size and the highest average in the class but nobody is one, two, three. Um, and this is the policy for calculation of valedictorian and salutatorian. Uh, note that's a ways off. So guidance counseling, um, we're very fortunate again to be restored to a two, two counselor um, team. It takes two counselors, two and a half we actually have. And we remain with the same students throughout the four years. We provide um, parent nights, individual, um, you know, these meetings with the kids. Of course, if kids are in a place of needing more intensive counseling, we make those referrals. We also, in the last few years, have the um, Jewish Board of Family Services has installed a counselor, a social worker who is more of a therapist in our school. We do host a lot of parent nights such as these. We go into the classrooms um, once a semester. I think we should go more. For the 11th grade, uh, we do, but the teachers are very, uh, they don't like, they like the students to themselves, as I've always said, but who can blame them, right? They wanna teach, teach, teach. Course programming. So the thing to know about course programming for ninth and 10th grade, the courses are pretty set. New York State does not, uh, we don't give any shortened programs. If a student has attained all of his or her credits, we do not like say, all right, you could leave early in school in senior year. That does not happen. They are filled with electives and such. Um, let's see. And again, always until the 10th hour, as Ms. Teslick said, we, we uh, program for that HSAS diploma. Uh, let's see. So if kids fail a course, since we're not like English one is in the fall, English two is in the spring, English 
score is in the fall. If a student fails like English two, they have to wait till the follow either summer school or the following spring to make it up. Um, occasionally with some courses, they can take it the next semester, but basically because we are a semester school, the class that's failed usually has to be retaken in the same semester that it's failed. We do not permit any advancing, students can't move ahead quickly to graduate quickly. Um, that is not something we do. And again, um, US history, world history, at least every student will graduate with two AP courses. Um, this, this section, I didn't really highlight anything. I think it was too lengthy to go over. But what I have wanted to say about the English courses here, we've evolved to a place in these 17 years, I would say a good 80 to 90% of the class take English language um, in 11th grade and AP English literature in 12th grade. There's very few students who don't. And those, again, are handled on a case-by-case -case basis. And there are elective courses and other courses. Um, the science courses, again, usually it's a 90 or better is the pretty, uh, pretty standard grade. And then those kids who really want to take, you know, kids wake up in high school. They evolve. Their grades change. There's always hope. We go through things. Um, if a student really wants to take um, an AP course, there is an appeals process. As I mentioned earlier, the AP calculus, everybody will have a shot because if they weren't programmed as an advanced student in ninth grade, they then have this double up opportunity in spring of 11th grade. And most kids have done it successfully. Uh, we state a little bit of something in the council recommendation letter. You know, I think it's a big taking undertaking to do that math doubling. I commend those kids that do that. And there's quite a number of them. It's usually a large like chunk of kids that do that. The AP Spanish has made a couple of recent changes. They have, you know, all the kids, in, that's the one grade in Spanish and math. You'll see 10th and 11th, 11th and 12th graders sharing. It's a nice way because then they, they, they get to know each other. Um, this year was the first year they've actually welcomed some 10th graders into the AP Spanish course. And again, because it is such a small school, the, these kids who are usually native speakers have a very strong background, are identified quickly, early, um, personally. They do not slip through the cracks. Um, it's a small enough school. And again, in meeting these, your children and students who are listening, a lot of you, when, when we asked the question, why, what drove you to HSAS? And a lot said the small school, they wanted that small school, um, that small school um, feeling. So Spanish placement, it's a long thing. It's a little confusing. I'm still confused, but I, I kind of get it. Um, but again, I want to reemphasize that kids are properly, properly placed. And if something is not proper, they come forward and we fix it. It's just that simple. Um, program changes. So in ninth and 10th grade, your program students are very, it's quite set. Why is it quite set? Because of the extra history class. You're taking, you know, in the New York state, it's a one year course you're taking an extra two years of, of United States history, not allowing room for uh, electives. It's when 11th grade starts that you start to have electives and room in the program for college courses. Um, we are a small school. Some students have had the same teacher two or three times. We do not ever really accommodate teacher change requests unless it's a very extreme situation. I think I've seen it once maybe in all the years I'm there. Um, so we do not um, honor those requests. And again, the main issue to think about with course programming families is um, it is really about class size, balancing class sizes, keeping them small, because we all know small classes work better. Um, uh, so sometimes, again, to fix a conflict or programming error, and then Lehman College courses. 
again, some of these requirements have changed because the PSAT scoring has changed, but basically you have to really be doing well in your HSAS courses. Again, we look at 85 as a benchmark, going back to that original question of credit, CR, credit, um, I would be very discerning on what grades I change. That's, that's another discussion. But again, if students, we want all students to take at least one course or that we've made it a graduation requirement. If a student has below an 85, again, small school, you write a letter of appeal to the principal. And again, Lehman keeps you know, their budget, our budget, how many classes we get, how their programming al aligns with our programming is a very important um, aspect. One thing to know is once a student is in a Lehman course, you can't call the college professor. They are treated like college students. They adhere to all the college regulations. Um, we, you know, the students have to really advocate for themselves and deal with any issues that arise with any uh, professors or instructors. Full disclosure, we've had a couple of teachers that haven't worked for our community and then we don't use those classes anymore, but it's been a wonderful experience and these are very transferable. Uh, they, they equate to money and it's a great, great part of the school um, on so many levels. Um, once a student starts a gleaming course, they may not drop it. They're, the school is very strict about that. And of course, back to that notion of accommodations, if a student has a 504 and they have exams at Lehman, that does not, they would have to go, every college has an office of disabilities um, and the student would have to make those provisions through Lehman College directly. Um, a student uh, who receives a D or an F in a college course on their first shot out, that's it. They're done with college courses. So that's my little section for now. And I am going to stop my share. I don't see any, I'm going to stop the share. I, I pulled up a couple, there's a couple of questions that I think I can answer. Um, oh, great, I'll stop the share so I can so see. So I'll do that. And then I was just going to invite everybody to stretch for a minute, because I know I need to. Um, <laughs> So first, um, there was a question, what if a child started on Spanish five? So I'm assuming it's like you started on Spanish five or like, you know, third year Spanish in freshman year. So you take Spanish five, six, um, then you would be um, taking AP Spanish. And then after AP, AP Spanish, there are Spanish elective courses. Um, I believe there's like Historia y Cine. Um, I am... Sorry, my Spanish is bad. That's a very new thing that we have added in the school. Yeah. To yeah. make sure so, that the students get those three years. Yeah, so they will get the three years. Um, they will have two extra electives in that year after the AP Spanish course. Um, and there was another question. Um, what is the current thought on science regions for this year? I, I don't know, IDK. <laughs> um, <laughs> Regents are being waived. Um, it's hard to tell what's going to happen by June. Um, maybe by then they won't be waived anymore. We don't have any information yet. When we do have information, we will share it with you. Uh, and somebody said, what was LOTE? LOTE is language other than English test. So for the advanced regents diploma, there are nine different um, regents exams that are required. And one of them is the LOTE. Um, students who are in their third year of Spanish take that lote, that language other than English. Some people say lote, I say lote. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and I think that was everything. Um, I'm going to turn that off for a second and just invite people to, you won't see me because I've got my nice virtual background, but just stand up. Well, you will see me, you see my sweater. Stretch. Move your arms. Uh, yoga. Maybe smack your face a little bit. This is hard. Um, 
I've developed a bad back over the last year of just like doing this all the time. I'm sure you um, can understand. Um, <laughs> okay, so I am gonna share my screen. Enjoy that stretch. You can keep that stretch going, whatever you need to do. There's all kinds of yoga in your chair. I would love to do that right now, but um, I better move on. <laughs> okay, so let me find my, I need to find the right one. Okay, I'm going to share. And I believe we are at, we're going to kind of shift our focus a little bit and talk about kind of study skills, tips for success in high school, um, always with the caveat that we know that these are strange times um, and some of these things are hard to implement when you're at home doing your work in front of a screen. Um, but I just wanted to go over a couple things that are listed on this uh, um, handout called Tips for Successful, successful Students. Uh, you know, it's really important to have good study skills. Um, one part of that is really setting goals. Um, uh, sometimes I'll talk to students and they'll say, uh, well, my goal for, you know, I had like a, you know, a C minus, uh, so I want to get an A um, or all A's, you know. Um, and so I, I think it's really important to make sure that your goals are manageable, that they're realistic, and that there are things you can, like if it's a big goal, you can kind of chunk it into smaller goals, okay? Um, if, you, if you make a goal that's like too far out to achieve within a certain amount of time, you won't achieve it and you will be demoralized by it and less likely to set more goals in the future. So make sure they're realizable, they're realistic, they're specific, break down big, big goals into manageable parts. Uh, getting organized. Um, in high school, there are a lot of long-term papers, projects, you name it. There's a lot more to do. Um, and at HSAS as a specialized high school, um, there's definitely a lot to do, uh, even in virtual land. So it's really important to figure out and work with your child to figure out um, what organizational plan works well for them. Some people do really well with color-coded folders like mine. Mine are all like plastic, so I don't like, you can't see them because of my screen. <laughs> um, mine are all plastic, so I don't, you know, ruin them because I'm constantly like uh, picking them up and adding stuff to them. So I, I write the name of what, what's on the folder and I color code them. Um, so it, it really depends on your particular personality, the student's personality, your child's personality, um, and what works well with their brain. Um, but the key point is that some systems should be in place. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, I, I think some, maybe a student or two told me they got the planner and some said they didn't. Maybe I can get like a quick, um, Thumbs up if you got an HSAS planner. I don't think it happened this year. Thumbs down? No, uh, Miss. No, uh, it didn't happen this year. We did not order them. Yeah, and yeah. oh, somebody made a sad face. Yes, um, yes, it was one of the many things that were, you know, impacted negatively by the pandemic. The nice of the pandemic. Um, <laughs> okay, so, but if you don't have an HSAS planner, um, there are different things you can use. Um, some students um, work really well with electronic calendars or old fashioned calendars in front of them. Just kind of knowing and playing with different styles and figuring out what your style is, is really important um, for organization, right? Um, so, Having something where you know what's coming up in the in the following week and then also in the following month, like the big things that are coming up in the month that can be in front of you, either on your phone, on an app, electronically, somewhere on your computer or device, you know, just coming up with a system. Um, creating a study environment. I'm going to kind of talk about this in, in another article that comes up. Um, and so I'm going to let this well, uh, I'll say a couple things. I, I don't know. I could I could do a poll right now, but um, I'm not going to. Creating a study environment right now is really hard for people. I am wedged in on 
a tiny table in between a huge bookcase, um, my bike and my son's bike. And like, I just hit my <laughs> helmet um, <laughs> and a window. Thankfully, there's a window. You know, we're all kind of struggling with space and constraints, but as much as possible, setting aside a space that um, can be for your child. And maybe even if they can move locations when they're just like, oh, I can't deal with sitting here anymore and go to another location for a variety or, um, you know, stop and do, you know, stop and drop and do 20 push-ups and then go back to work, you know, but, um, you know, having, having a study space, trying to keep it with few distractions, um, you know, using noise cancellation headphones is great. Um, also, um, you know, some people, you know, can use music to concentrate. Some people, it's really going to distract them. So just kind of knowing your child, helping your child with this, and they'll probably have a sense of that already because they've been going through school for eight or nine years or whatever it is. So um, I'm going to move on to extracurricular um, activities. And this is where I do have a bit of a um, Zoom poll. I just want to make sure. First, I just um, I just want to say, obviously, that extracurricular activities, it goes without saying, have been negatively impacted by COVID-19, as many things have. A lot of the, uh, all the PSAL sports are not happening. Um, however, people are getting creative and things are still going on. So with that, I am going to do another quick poll. Uh, relaunch polling. Huh. Polling is closed. What happens if I do that? Relaunching the poll will clear the existing. Yes, that's what I want to do. Okay. Now, oh, no, no, no. End polling. I want to do a new poll. <laughs> All right. Guys, tech issues, I'm not going to do it. Um, maybe what I'll have you do is put a thumbs up if your child is involved in at least one extracurricular activity, and that can be either at HSAS or outside of HSAS. So I've got one, two, and I don't know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I can't even get through all of them. Yes, okay, so I'm gonna minimize this. What I heard from the students uh, who I spoke to individually as well on my side um, of the alphabet, I heard amazing things about how students are adapting to COVID and still being active. And so I just wanted to share some of the things that I heard from your kids. Um, I heard about kids at HSAS being involved in cross country. Um, cross country is huge at HSAS. And I was like, whoa, I'm a runner. How are you doing that? Um, what they're doing is they all get on a Google Meet together, I guess on their phones, and they run, <laughs> which I thought was just so creative and such a, uh, a wonderful and uplifting workaround, you know, in, in these difficult times. Um, kids are involved in debate. There's community service club is still doing things virtually. Um, poetry club, drama club, dance club. Dance club, they're like figuring out choreographing pieces and, and like doing it on video with each other, you know? So things are happening. Um, outside of HSAS, I heard a lot about people being on swim teams, which I was really jealous of because I love swimming. And I can't swim anymore. Um, soccer, studying instruments, studying other languages, virtual tutoring of other people, virtual volunteering, um, other sports, you know, a lot of them mainly outdoors, but I heard a lot of good things. Um, so with the extracurricular activities, I'm not really going to read through this. I'm just going to kind of talk to you about my own thoughts about the benefits of extracurriculars. Um, before I get into that, I just want to say, you know, if your child is not involved in any extracurricular, especially this year, do not beat yourself up over it and do not have the, the kids who are out there, the students who are out there listening to this, you should not take this as a 
a reprimand and that you should be involved. Everybody goes at their own pace and this year, much more so than ever, right? Um, transitioning to high school has been rough enough this year. But typically what we see in other years is that students kind of fall into one of two buckets. Some students come in raring to go and they get involved right away. And some other students take a year, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years even to get involved in the offerings that we have either at HSAS or outside of school. And, you know, so there's a real variation there and everything is okay. Um, the benefits of extracurriculars are many. Um, first of all, social benefits. You get to know others. Um, you get to know students across different grade levels. Um, you get to know yourself. You get to learn more about your values, your talents, and your skills. And you get to kind of develop those further and kind of experiment and see like, oh, like, is this for me? Oh, maybe it's not, but oh, actually this other thing really is, you know? Um, you get to explore interests that may lead to potential future majors and careers. And um, having more in your schedule, actually not too much, having more stuff in your schedule, not too much stuff can make you better at time management. It kind of forces you into an efficiency that sometimes when we don't have those extra things, you become less efficient. And I'm sure everyone can understand that this year, um, especially when we've been more in our houses and limited. So that's what I wanted to say about extracurriculars. Um, and, you know, obviously we are hoping that um, things will be opening up more and that PSAL sports, which are big at HSAS, will come back for those students who really love sports. Um, and the other clubs and things that have had a little more difficulty translating to virtual, um, they will be back. Um, so that's about extracurriculars. The next thing, um, this is from the Child Mind Institute. It's an article that I found about kind of supporting your kid at home during virtual learning. And you'll note that it says for grades 10 through 12, but we're halfway through ninth grade. Um, and your kids at HSAS are really expected to take on a lot quickly and have done so this year already. So I think this applies to them. So this is from the Child Mind Institute. Um, it's a, um, an institute that does a lot with um, adolescent stress, relationships with um, parents and peers, mental health, and so on. They have all kinds of free and interesting articles. Um, I encourage you to check them out. Um, and I just want to note before we go into a couple things from this that this is just a kind of basic overview and a lot of you are going to be like, eh, I already know this. I'm already doing this. We're like almost a year into this pandemic, you know, what do you got for me? Um, but we're just providing it to you, you as a general audience in, um, in the hopes that some people will find it um, helpful. And some people will find it good to just remind them about things that they are already doing. So um, the main takeaways from this article is that, um, you know, in high school, students are really expected to learn differently at a much more accelerated rate. They need to um, synthesize and show their learning um, of information on a much more sophisticated level, especially in their speaking and their writing. Um, and so this year, obviously, they're doing all of this at home. Um, adolescence is also a time of great need for socialization. And I don't have to tell you that our kids are missing out on this a lot and they're struggling with it. Um, given this, um, I just want to stress that sometimes I will hear, you know, and more in the past, but, you know, parents saying like, you know, you need to focus on your grades. Don't worry about social interaction. Like your, your, your job is school. And yes, that's very much true. Um, however, um, the developmental need that all kids at this age have is to socialize and to learn about the world through their social interactions. 
And that what they learn through that gives them incredible skills that they'll take on to college and to jobs. Um, so it's very important too. Um, so within your family constraints and your particular comfort level with what's happening with the pandemic, um, I really encourage you to um, encourage your child and facilitate them in social interactions as much as possible, whether that's online or whether that's in person with masks on and distance. You know, I, I hear a lot of stories of kids who are meeting up in parks, going for walks. You know, um, I take my son out every day to the park, you know, put my snow pants on, um, I'm freezing, you know, but whatever, we do it. Um, not every day, but I try. Um, so the other thing that this is talking about, so socializing, um, how can you best support your students? Helping them stick to a schedule. This is kind of what we already talked about in the handout a couple handouts ago. Um, you know, making sure that they establish a daily routine and that their schoolwork remains a priority and also setting clear ex ex uh, expectations for when schoolwork is to be completed and when preferred activities will become available. So, you know, making sure that video games and social time, while it is very important, like first they need to prioritize and show you that they are prioritizing their schoolwork. Um, we talked about setting up an effective workspace. Um, so I don't need to cover that, um, you know, setting, I'm not going to go into executive functioning too much, setting clear boundaries with them. Um, a lot of times right now when we're all like stuck in at home. Um, it, we might be tempted when our kids have questions to just like kind of take over and give them the answers, but it's more beneficial to teach them the skills for, um, you know, how to facilitate answering the question on their own. Um, so building their independence, um, you know, making sure that, you know, they have their work completed and that, you know, you, as long as you know that you're not going to keep reminding them about it. Um, what's the best schedule for grades for students in grades 10 to 12? Like basically what this is saying is there is no best schedule and you guys already know this. Um, and the main thing is that try to be in try to be as consistent as possible also while being flexible because everything has to change on a dime sometimes um and i just want to stress that uh it's really important that schedules incorporate as much breaks exercise time to socialize incorporating healthy habits for sleeping. I hear a lot of students are not sleeping super well, um, you know, but trying to set a regular schedule for sleep so they get eight to 10 hours of sleep and exercise. Um, and, you know, that's just something for you. You can look at this more in detail. You can check out the Child Mind um, Institute on your own. Um, they have, um, newsletters that you can sign up for. They're a really great organization. I just wanted to share a little bit of that with you. And I'm going to stop my share and hand it over to Ms. Harris. Okay. So you've hung in there for this long and we commend you. We've lost a few of you, but I'm just going to wrap it up in a very, very short amount of time if anybody has to go. But I do want to summarize what's going on with college testing because that's a very hot topic as always, and you'll hear me repeat it and repeat it. And it's in the blood of the veins of the HSAS students and the down the block Bronx Science and my friend works at Brooklyn Tech. And we all just hear about the, te the testing. And then I do wanna take a minute or two to talk about careers and how we really have to integrate that more into our school culture. So I am going to share my screen and I will be very, very quick, I promise. So let me get um, to, the, to that handout. We have them all numbered. Okay, the future of college exa um, entrance exams. So basically also I wanna take notes of the dates that things came out. So uh, backtracking, this article was published May 19th, 2020. We gave the SAT sponsored, paid for by the DOE at March 4th, March 4th to our juniors, our now graduating seniors. 
almost everyone took it, one or two opt, a few opt out because they know they're taking the SAT, ACT rather. And one said, you know, I don't wanna take it. I'm not ready. I remember this girl. Then the whole thing happened. The schools closed March 17th. So um, college, all the colleges went test optional, large, small, public, gigantic universities with thousands of students. So the University of California, which California has been in the news a lot throughout this pandemic for a multitude of reasons, but their nine UCs, um, including Berkeley and UCLA, they were planning before the pandemic to eliminate this, uh, the, the testing altogether. Okay, so that was their biggest argument is, you know, that it does uh, disadvantaged students with less resources um, don't do as well on the on these tests. Okay, and they have challenged it, and it's tutoring, test prep, bribery. We saw we saw a lot of things in this realm before the pandemic. So then the pandemic comes, everything was canceled. Okay, now UC is a very very large system. I don't know. SUNY went test optional, which is our state system. Uh, you, interestingly, the Florida 12, there's 12 universities in Florida. Florida did not go test optional. Uh, Florida still required like U of U University of Florida in Gainesville. The Florida schools were the one, uh, one big public system that, uh, that, that the state is run differently and they did not go test optional. Um, so, Basically, I just took a few notes and I wanna just look at my notes. Um, so UCs were, were very strong on the subject test, which is ironic that they went for this big push and um, they were going to suspend these tests. Let me just get to my right page, hold on, that I'm looking at. Okay, so they were gonna suspend the test until 2024. Um, they were going to keep it till 2024 and then get rid of it until 2025. This was planned. Then this all got slammed by the pandemic. Again, they are making an equation that there is a relationship between race and socioeconomic status and the um, disparities there and the, the, um, the outcomes on these tests. Okay. So um, what I... College Board was going to put in this, this adversity score, and it got really panned, and people complained about it, and they did away with it. And again, the, um, the, the pandemic came. But I, this is really, really important here, feeling comfortable in exam settings. Kids that go to specialized high schools of all grades, I've seen kids with lower academic averages do phenomenally well on these tests. Tests, taking a test is a skill. I call it a sport. It was a sport I stuck at, but it, it is a sport nevertheless. And you guys are fantastic at it. Um, all the colleges went test optional. Um, we don't know exactly how the colleges have really selected the students without these tests. Colleges are not that transparent. Um, when it comes to this. Um, we just, we don't know. We also, there was a big, there's a big report that comes out every fall, just like you didn't get the planner. We didn't really get the full summary of what happened. Remember last year, the 70% of the kids that applied early decision, early decision decisions come out December 15th. So that was before the pandemic. Then it is the regular decisions that come out like, late March, early April, and the pandemic was really taking, taking hold then. Now, the problem here is that some of these schools might end up creating their own kinds of other test screenings. So of course the college board is fighting for its leverage in this whole thing. Um, kids are already, I'm getting emails, oh, can we take more AP exams? I mean, you guys are just test hungry, test savvy. Um, so the, the whole world of testing is just kind of really up in the air. 
HSAS, now there is a, if you guys have a pad, write down the website, fairtest.com. We'll give it to you. There was always a test optional movement with the belief system that a test is just a few hours. It doesn't summarize and say what a transcript does. The most competitive college that went test optional a few years ago was University of Chicago. They were at the top of the heap. I'm just going to get my next, my next handout. Um, okay, let me. How do I go? Oh, oh, let me get my next handout. Okay. Um, test optional, test blind. So when, when, when University of Chicago went test optional, um, it was really, really a big deal. At HSAS, I don't think we've ever, ever had a kid go test optional. During this crazy cycle, one, one, one student did, and we revisited it. And moving along, I suggested to that student to submit in, 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 in the HSA world, that student felt that the score was low. It was, it was in the 89th, 90th percentile. But we don't know what's gonna happen. And based on the poll, many of you, this is your first child in college, uh, in college, in high school, meaning it will be your first child in college. We want you to just, and again, full disclaimer, we find these articles on the internet, we look at blogs, we read articles, test optional. Well, let me just say what, what a few things is before I get in. We don't really know, these are the things we don't know. We, we know what happened at our school. We know that our kids had at least one test. We will always stand by as long as there is a test to take that the kids do take one test. These days of going to take the SAT three, four times, I've seen it even once or twice, five times, those days are gone. Um, what we don't really know, colleges on webinars that I went to reported that they got tons more applications and tons of applications with no tests. So what we don't know, the missing piece that we're trying to ascertain is did they take the group of the test takers and put them in one pile and then take the group of the test optional and put them in another pile? What did they really do to choose these applicants? Because I've seen kids over the years stress over, not str maybe stress isn't the right word, but again, we will try to keep you informed as what we, what we know, but we know very little right now as to what really went on behind the closed doors. So test optional is meaning, what it really means is you have the option to not submit your test, but you can't change your mind. You can't take it back. Once you check that box, you can't then go get an SAT you like and change your mind. So it's a decision that is made. Test blind means you can, they will not even look at the test. And the big shocker to me was um, CUNY went not test optional, but test blind. I'm still not sure. I guess they just deal with so many applications and they're going based off regions and transcripts and have some kind of rubric, but they went completely test blind. Um, SUNY did not. So we all don't like US News and World. We have a love hate with that, with that, with that list. But let's face it, if I did a poll and I said, how many people look at it, we get a lot of hands up. So this was just the top 20 schools. There were some ties of, uh, of the schools that did go test optional. Again, I went to group webinars where multiple colleges came together to report. And what I got is that they got many more um, applications and many more that were test optional because kids felt boxed out of certain colleges that they couldn't go into those colleges. So again, these are popular colleges. We see a lot of applicants applications to these are the smaller uh, liberal arts colleges. So again, this is something to watch and we sort of have to kind of reprogram our students a bit, you know, around this landscape of testing. And then the last, two minutes of the meeting, the last few five minutes of the meeting. What I do want to talk about, this is just a handout actually back on the topic of Florida. We've been using these for a while. This comes from a college level career center. And 
we really do need to do more. Uh, a well-directed career research can really change and shape a, a child's path to the future and to college. These are great because I picked history because we're a history school and it shows a little bit of some sample op occupations. Somebody who might like history might get into. This is something worth um, sitting with your child and doing. Uh, some sample work settings, employers, websites. And what I think is really cool on this page is also um, the, um, all these links here. And again, that's what guidance counselors do. We synthesize information and try to fine tune it for you, but also teaching students about professional organizations. These are good places like we're members of two to look for internships, to look for programs right within, and again, these match major sheets are great. You can get them off the Florida Atlantic University uh, career website. And then lastly, again, we really have been working very hard at American Studies to develop a more uh, career uh, in every guidance meeting that we have with the students we do present something on careers. We feel it is critically important. This is just an article written mid pandemic. Um, and it's very easy to research through the Occupational Outlook Handbook and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, what the jobs are. Now, what they're suggesting here is, um, you know, experts from the Forbes and New York Times are recommending a different approach. I can't say that I totally, agree with this about developing, um, you know, developing a passion for a job you can do well than, than just following your passion. But there is a reality of learning how to be self-sufficient and sustain one's lifestyle. So um, you can track job growth. There's enough data out there to follow this, even as this pandemic unravels, concludes. And this is a list of the top 18 career fields based on real hard data that are um, going to have some expected growth in the next um, 10 years or so. So um, really, again, it's something we want to bring. We started doing a, an annual career day, uh, which was something we didn't have, something I personally feel a deep, deep, deep passion for, and really doing that research um, we're so focused on education and the SAT and the GPA and getting into a good college, but what is it we're really after and what is the path pathway there? So um, I hope that you will look at these handouts and look at some of the educational requirement. One that really caught my, my eye, now you don't hear about it too much. And remember, I don't do any social media. The only social media I do have is LinkedIn, a student a former student came stamping into my office and said, Ms. Harris, we must have a LinkedIn page. So that's, I see what the kids are doing. Remember, we had our first graduating class in 2006. There's two students I have followed for over, um, I don't know, uh, maybe 11 or 12 years now. They both became doctors, two young women that took different paths. And I keep in touch with them on a fairly regular basis. Uh, but, you know, there are some really good the medical fields. So we really hope that you will look this over, look at it with your child and try to, um, when we give you access to Naviance, you will see lots of interesting career uh, resources there linked to the, um, the Occupational Outlook Handbook, videos, um, all kinds of things. I thought this one was really interesting. Construction manager, you know, it's not something that you hear people saying they want to do. It is a college education. Um, it is a very, very, uh, um, it is a very respected profession. It is a high paying profession. So some kids I think need to really do a little bit more work in this career area. I think we need to do more as a school and I hope to continue to grow that area. So now I am stopping to share. We are down to 47 of you and uh, we thank you for coming. If anybody has any, there's some questions in the chat. Yes. Okay. Um, um, I, I, I had some questions that I tried to go through and answer in the chat, you know, because I know we are running late. Um, 
and I hope they were all um, uh, answered to the best of my ability. Um, I, I guess I can try to pull up and see. I think we're good. Um, yeah. And if you have any specific like transcript questions, changing a grade from N uh, to the CR, any of these handouts that you you know want um, to look at, I will send out that typical grading scale. We might have even given it out. It's something you can quickly Google. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask out loud? Oh. Then we got to look at hands. OK. Uh, a laptop, so. Nope, I don't see anything. OK. Well, that's a wrap. Oh, oh, oh we got hands. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right. Um, Sing, sing I, sing A, sing A, sing I. Um, can you unmute? <laughs> Thanks for putting this together. I just had a quick question about the homework load. It just seems that um, there's been a lot of stress and, and a lot of talk about um, taking breaks and all that, but the homework load is really heavy. I was just wondering what people are doing um, about that. So regarding the homework load, I know that Mr. Weiss has been talking with the teachers and staff. When we have meetings, we discuss it. He strongly um, discourages them from adding additional assignments. Um, it is an ongoing conversation. It's something that I think is always a difficulty in specialized high schools already to begin with. And with the pandemic, it has become increasingly difficult to manage. Um, typically, teachers would just go to the teacher's lounge and there's like, a, you know, like we try to separate out when tests are given and all that kind of stuff and they can talk about what's happening and there's been a little bit of a lack of communication, but they're trying to make it up through uh, the student um, government working with Mr. Weiss. Um, and it's a work in progress. You know, we're communicating back, you know, what we hear from the students as well. I wonder if there's um, any way to tally up how much time everyone is actually spending versus what is the estimated time for homework? I'd just be curious to see what the students are actually experiencing versus what the expectation is. I think the student government actually did do a survey and asked them about that. And then we shared the results, the, the head of the student government, um, the, um, why am I blanking on the teacher's name? Um, shared it with- Urado. Ah, oh, Mr. Urado. It's like, you don't see anyone, you forget everyone's names um shared it with everyone in a faculty meeting and so it's it's something that we're still working on and when we know more we'll let you know but i know it is frustrating also they've really tried not to give uh, homework over the break and this you know this doe policy with the nx it's it, it's it's understood it's 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 a leniency that needed to be um this is a very strange time. I, I don't, um, somebody put in a, a question in the chat about working with the kids on organization. I know some kids individually, I've been working at it with, you know, how to get a little bit more organized. And you would think that kids were not really going anywhere and doing too much that they'd be getting all their work done. Um, but there's that lack of structure with the sports I mean, the kids that I've seen over the years in that school, they would be on all the sports, they'd have all this amount of homework. So we are listening and we are trying um, under these very unusual, horrible times. I'm just being honest about how I feel about the pandemic. I hope no one minds, but it's not. Yeah. I don't think anybody would disagree. <laughs> So I think we have one more question from Zuhaili, and then I think we'll need to wrap up. Um, my son is about to kill me. <laughs> Hi, it's, it's less of a question and more of a statement on the homework. Um, and I'm seeing some comments that are probably more aligned to, to hear my son. Um, I haven't had any problems with the homework load. He's waking up early and he's doing some time management on his own. 
And he says that the Google Calendar really helps with kind of lining out, all, aligning all of your schoolwork and all of the homework. So he kind of just sticks to it and he's able to take some breaks um, in the day and we haven't had a problem with it. Excellent. Yeah, um, and I just want to make a plug that um, uh, maybe Zuhaili, if you can send me an email, um, I, I maybe I, I was thinking that I'd like to get together some of the students that I spoke to um, who said that they're managing things all right. And I do want to do a workshop with students um, on study skills and time management. The issue is um, fitting it in and me feeling really terrible about then telling them, oh, we're going to do this at like five o'clock, you know, after you've been on your computer all day. But um, it is in the works. It is stuff that I already talked to a lot of kids about. Um, and so, yeah, I would like to even have a couple ninth graders who are handling things pretty well just kind of talk about their experience. Yeah. Um, if you want to get in touch with my daughter, she's not. Okay. Confused. Yeah, send me an email. Okay. Two points I just want to make also is that we really, and again, when I had the individual meetings with the students, I really encourage them to be communicative with their teachers and ask their teachers for guidance and tips and also like trying new things. And you reference this, Ms. Tesla, you can't go from here to there, but they have to implement um, one you know, new thing. And if you, you think your child needs a little more help with this piece, I've seen again, historically over the years at American Studies, as the work gets bigger and harder, the kids get used to it and they learn to master it and they learn what's expected of them. Um, they get to know kids in other grades. As a result, they get guidance from uh, mentorship. Some of the things that are just regularly in place as a function of physically being in school are just not there right now that um, would push push this along in, in, in a particular way. Agreed. Thank you, thank you Ms. Tesla, for everything. No, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it was really a pleasure to have you. I'm so sorry that um, we went over um, I hope um, it was helpful. And um, yes, um, thank you, Ms. Fiore, for being here. And again, do not forget New York City Schools account. Really important. Yes, guys. please log in. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye. Yes. Everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop recording now if I can figure out how. Okay, stop. Sure.